Well, every Lord's Day, God gathers his people. He calls us out from among the nations. He calls us to Mount Zion. He calls us to know him uh, by whom we have been known, even from the foundation of the world. Let's stand together as God calls us into his presence in the words of Psalm 96, verses 1 through 6. O oh, sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing to Yahweh all the earth. Sing to Yahweh, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but Yahweh made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Amen. Let's bow together. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of the Lord's day. We thank you for the eternal rest that is ours in Jesus Christ. Rest from sin and from sorrow. Rest with you, O Lord, the true, the living, and the triune God who has called us into an eternal communion. O Lord, we pray that this day you would lift the burden of sin and care from our hearts and bring us with joy and gratitude into your very presence. Meet with us, O God, and speak to us. Make our hearts open and receptive to all that you say. Fill us, O Lord, with joy and peace through believing in Jesus, our Savior and Mediator. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing together the Gloria Pottery this morning, number 572. Our scripture reading this morning will come to us from Zechariah chapter 9. If you'd like to turn and follow along there or listen carefully as we hear God's word read, that word that is holy, inspired, and inerrant, Zechariah chapter 9, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament prophetic literature in terms of speaking of Christ. This stands alongside texts in Isaiah, in Micah, in Jeremiah that speak with such great clarity about the Redeemer who is coming and the work of atonement that he will accomplish. The people of God, eschatologically, will be delivered from sin and from destruction, but they will be delivered through the judgment that God is pouring out. You see that as we move through the first half of the chapter and then come into the more explicit messianic affirmations in the second part. Hear now God's word, Zechariah chapter 9. The oracle of the word of Yahweh is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. For Yahweh has an eye on mankind and on all the tribes of Israel, and on Hamath also, which borders on it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power on the sea, and she shall be devoured by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be afraid, Gaza too, and shall writhe in anguish, Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza, Ashkelon shall be uninhabited, a mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. 
Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them, for now I see with my own eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. Then Yahweh will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord Yahweh will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. Yahweh of hosts will protect them, and they shall devour and tread down the sling stones, and they shall drink and roar as if drunk with wine, and be full like a bowl, drenched like the corners of the altar. On that day, Yahweh their God will save them as the flock of his people, for like the jewels of a crown they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great his beauty! Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he add his blessing to it. What a blessed hope. What a great promise and what a great opportunity we have living on this side of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus to look back and to see that God has indeed kept his word and fulfilled that salvation which he promised. Let's take our hymnals now and turn to number 162. Number 162 as we sing Psalms and hymns of praise together today we will sing number 162, Lord Jesus Christ be present now. Our reading of the law today comes from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. I'll be reading verses 16 through 18. If you wish to follow along or listen carefully, over the last few months we have been reading portions of the Sermon on the Mount. Most Lord's Days is our reading of the law, and we come now to a portion of the text, a portion of our Lord's discourse that is perhaps less familiar to modern Western Christians, certainly in a more Protestant and evangelical context. Uh, few people are as familiar with the discipline of fasting 
And even though they may know of it, they may not know personally by experience much about it. Uh, it seems uh, that at least some Protestant Christians believe that fasting is one of those Old Testament practices that ended with the time of Jesus, right? After the, the death of God's Son. And yet, on the contrary, we find Jesus more than once in the Gospels alluding to the fact that this practice would continue even in the time of the New Covenant and after His resurrection. But here is a sober word from our Lord regarding its practice. Hear now God's word, Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Thus far God's word. Now what we have seen throughout this section so far in Matthew chapter 6 is that Christ is teaching us and calling us to a God-toward focus in our religion and in our practice of piety. That it is not so much a matter as to, to whether other people do realize that you are a believer. We would hope that all people know that you are a believer in Jesus. It's not so much that, that it's a problem if someone knows that, oh, oh my, you, you gave alms, or you said a prayer, or you were fasting. It, it's not as though all of these things are to be kept secret, and, and somehow the, the blessing is no longer to be enjoyed if, if anyone else finds out. But Jesus' point is that these practices of piety are between you and the Lord. They are not to be a matter of public display. You're not to be living your faith in such a way that you're trying to get other people to look at you. Look at me. See how godly I am. See how humble I am. See how pious my life really is. And yet we live in a culture, we live in a world that is all about, look at me. It, it informs the, the clothes that we wear. It informs the, the entire existence, I think, of social media, right? Would we have social media otherwise? Look at me. Look at how wonderful my life is or how miserable my life is. But, but, but look at me nonetheless. And Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast, not on the off chance that you might one day fast. He's assuming that you will fast because you will be committed to a life of prayer. And prayer and fasting go closely, hand in hand. He says, when you fast, don't parade it around. Don't display to others this practice of fasting that you're engaged in at the time. Don't mope around as, as if by, by the extremity of your own commitment to piety, you are now experiencing misery and you want all of the saints to know it, right? He says, no, anoint your, uh, your head, wash your face, put on... Th th this is not about being dishonest with your brothers and sisters, but it is about living quorum Deo, before the face of God. Not living so that you might be seen by men. Knowing that it is enough that I am drawing near to God, and that I do not need to be patted on the back... To, to be encouraged or comforted by my brothers and sisters by, by convincing them of how religious I truly am. The reality is that even in our most righteous deeds, even in our best acts as religious people, we still see the sinful nature. We still see pride. We still, still see selfishness. We still see the desire for other people to look at us and to praise us when in fact all glory is to go to God. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy name give glory. That must be our prayer at all times. And sometimes we can see our sin most clearly, not in looking at our bad deeds that we know are wrong, but in recognizing how contaminated even our best deeds are. And that should truly humble us. Every Lord's Day we recite together is our corporate confession of sin, the words that Paul teaches us in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. If you'll take out your bulletin and look in the worship order, you'll find printed there on the facing page a corporate prayer of confession that we use on the second Lord's Day of each month. A form of prayer 
not to be merely read or recited, but as a way of together, lifting our hearts, opening our mouths, confessing together before the throne of grace the sin that we know so well and that we desire God's grace and mercy to deliver us from. Let's pray together. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess that we are by nature prone to evil and sluggish in good. You know how often we have sinned in wandering from your holy will, in wasting your good gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. We are ashamed, every one of us, and we are sorry for all the ways in which we have turned away from you. Teach us to hate our sin. Forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Make our conscience clean again. Look not at our sinful hearts, but only at the spotless purity and righteousness of your beloved Son. Assure our hearts that we are accepted in him. O Spirit of Christ, take away our love of sin and fill us with love for Christ. Make us long for the day when we shall meet him in the clouds of glory. Persuade our hearts that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so cause us to serve him with all that is in us, in Jesus' name. Amen indeed. If you will, stand with me as God speaks words of pardon, assuring us of his love, assuring us of his mercy. If you're committed to regularly reading through the Psalms, surely you've stumbled over Psalm 131 at some point in that reading and practice of prayer. Hear the word of the Lord and know that David speaks by the Spirit, ultimately of Christ, but in Christ also of you who have been forgiven of your sins, who are indwelt by His Spirit, who have been accounted as righteous, not for the sake of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done. Hear God's word. O oh, Yahweh, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore. Let each of you truly acknowledge that he is a sinner, humbling himself before God, and believe that the Heavenly Father wills to be gracious unto you in Jesus Christ. To all those that repent in this way and look to Jesus Christ for their salvation, be assured that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen, Amen indeed. Let's take our hymnals again and turn in the Psalter portion to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, Arrangement A, Psalm 103A. We're going to sing all six verses of this song, but you will notice that three verses are printed on the first page, and then you're going to need to turn the page, right? So we'll sing all six verses of Psalm 103A, Bless the Lord, My Soul.
seated. It's a blessing to be able to praise God and to celebrate the forgiveness and mercy that we find in Him by His Son. Let's bow together in prayer now. Our great God and Father, what a blessing it is to be able to call upon you in this way. We know, O Lord, that we are not your children by birth, but by adoption. Not by any natural right, but by a spiritual gift. We do not come today to claim any privilege that is properly our own, but we come resting in the work and righteousness of another, even your Son, Jesus our Lord. And we come, O Lord, to claim the promises that you have made, trusting that your word is true and celebrating the fact that it speaks peace to us who are unworthy but eternally grateful recipients of it. O Lord, it is you who have called us into eternal fellowship. You have made us your own. You have brought us the gift of everlasting joy. And yet as we come today, Father, we confess that we have not always lived as those who know this joy. We have felt the frustration and discontent and sinful resentment of those who believe they are entitled to more. We are ashamed, Father, and we are sorry, but we are thankful that you forgive us, and we are thankful that you have forgiven us by the blood of your Son, that you have raised us to everlasting life by the power of his resurrection, and that you have accounted to us a perfect righteousness, not our own, but that of our Lord. And we come, O God, thanking you that despite our many faults, despite many failures, despite how useless we are and how poor our attitude may often be, we come thanking you that you still love us as a father, better than any earthly father ever could, better than our own fathers have, and better than we have loved our own children. It is your love, O God, that comforts us. And we thank you, Father, that you loved us first and that you love us best and that you love us continually. Heavenly Father, you are the King of the universe, the maker and ruler of all things. We thank you, O God, for the freedom and prosperity that we enjoy in this nation that comes from your hand. We know these are your gifts, O Lord, and we pray for these blessings that they might continue. We pray for our rulers and leaders, even as you have taught us to pray. We pray for our president and his family for the officers in his cabinet, for our representatives and senators, our judges and governors and local magistrates. Please put your fear into their hearts, O God, that they might have true wisdom to rule. Cause them to rule so that your people may enjoy peace in the practice of godliness and that the freedom to proclaim Christ and to obey your word would continue to be enjoyed in this land. We pray, O Lord, for the rulers of other nations, and we pray that you would tear down barriers erected against the preaching of the gospel in other places. We pray for repentance, O Lord, both in our own nation as well as in others. We pray for repentance from sin and the wickedness that is celebrated and promoted even to our own destruction. We thank you, O God, that your kingdom that the visible church of the living God is apparent throughout the world and that your kingdom will stand when all of the nations of this world have fallen. And we pray, O Lord, that you would bless your church, that you would build her up everywhere that she is found, that you would strengthen and guide and purify her, that you would empower the church and its witness, O Lord, that you would cause the gospel to be spoken clearly and passionately through the daily witness of your saints and from pulpits on the Lord's day and through the evangelistic endeavors of those whom you send forth as heralds of Christ. We pray that where the gospel is preached, that there might be repentance and reformation. We pray, O Lord, for churches that have become carnal and corrupt, where the culture and values of this world have gained a foothold, where the authority of Scripture and the doctrine of God and the purity of the gospel have been compromised and neglected. We pray, O Lord, that you would send your spirit to convict and convert and consecrate these congregations anew. And where there is not repentance, O Lord, we pray that you would even close those doors so that the broader witness of your church and the public perception of the gospel would not be undermined by hypocrisy and pride. 
We thank you, O Lord, for the blessings that you've given to our own congregation. Thank you for the ruling elders that you have placed among us and over us, Lee and David and Mike and John. Thank you for their wives, O Lord. Thank you for Bruce, who serves us so well as a deacon, and for his wife also. Thank you for those, Lord, who volunteer their time and use the gifts that you have given them in so many areas. Thank you especially for the ministry of prayer and for the brotherly love of the saints that is such an encouragement to us. Please strengthen us and help us as we labor together in this congregation. Lord, we ask you to strengthen our families, that you would bless our children with a true and abiding faith in your Son, that they would not trust merely in a Christian heritage, but that they would be true heirs of Jesus Christ through a personal faith. We pray that you would help them to delight in worship and to love your church and rather embrace than resist or rebel that which they have known from childhood. We pray, O Lord, that you would help us as we integrate so many new families and individuals into our fellowship. It is a blessing, O Lord, to welcome those whom you have welcomed. And we pray, O God, for grace that we would see one another properly as brothers and sisters, as fellow heirs of the grace of life. Help us, help us to be patient and humble and wise as we work through the challenges, O Lord, of meeting new friends and family in the Lord Jesus and arranging things, O Lord, so that all the needs of your saints are met. We ask for your blessing on those who are enduring great trials in our congregation, for those who are sick and going through medical treatments, those who are grieving over death or the terminal illness of loved ones, those who are weighed down by daily pain, those who are tempted and tested by spiritual trials and, and do battle against the adversary. We pray that you would bless each of these dear saints, O Lord, that you would give us grace where we are in our greatest need, that you would surround us by your Spirit, that you would apply your love and promises to our hearts, that you would make us calm in the face of adversity and grant us peace even in the experience of pain. Please reassure us, O Lord, by the doctrine of your sovereign providence. Help us to know, not merely in our heads, but by our own experience, that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. We do ask, O God, that you would relieve suffering and that you would heal the sick among us, and that you would comfort the downhearted and encourage the discouraged. But more than these things, we pray that you would use even these trials to improve our hearts and to strengthen our faith, to confirm us in our hope in Christ and to draw us closer to yourself. We pray that you would make us more like Jesus and make us willing to suffer if necessary that we might know more perfectly the power of your Son. Please make our hearts strong for the journey set before us, O God, and bring us and our children safely to Zion. Together in the words that our Savior taught us, we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, indeed. Let's take our Psalters again and turn to Psalm 27. Number 27, arrangement A. And let's sing together, The Lord's My Light, number 27A.
brothers who are receiving the collection this morning will come to the front. At this time, we have an opportunity every Lord's Day to return to God a portion of that which he has generously given unto us that we might have fellowship together in the work of gospel ministry and that we might worship the Lord even as his people of old, even since patriarchal times, by returning unto him tithes and offerings as an expression of our gratitude to the ever-giving God. Before we take the offering this morning, let's bow and ask God's blessing upon it. Our God and Father, we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes down from your hand, is given to us, O Lord, from above, and that we are but stewards of the grace that you have committed to our care. Please bless us now, O Lord. Make us cheerful and generous in our giving. Bless us that we might be faithful stewards of that which you entrust to us. And please use us and these resources for the glory of your great name and for the spread of the glory of the gospel of your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. will take out your Bibles in the New Testament, be turning to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 21 to 30 this morning. I've never been good at sermon titles, but I'm not quite as bad as it is reflected in the bulletin. The title of this morning's sermon is not title. That was just an oversight on my part. The title, if you care, is Darkness Falls But Dawn Approaches, which I actually thought was one of my better titles, but <laughs> evidently the Lord wanted to humble me by keeping that out of the bulletin. So We're going to be looking at these verses, starting in verse 21, as Jesus, building upon the text that we looked at last Lord's Day, identifies his betrayer. You'll recall that Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. They are at what we call the Last Supper this is the same time when the synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell us the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, and he speaks to them at great length, as recorded here in the fourth gospel, preparing his apostles for what is soon to take place, not only concerning his death and then imminent resurrection, but also his ascension back to the Father's right hand, and the work that they are going to be sent out to do as apostles of Christ. Before we read God's word, let's bow and ask his blessing upon it. Our God and Father in heaven, as we open your word together this day, we pray that your spirit would open wide our hearts, open wide our eyes, open our ears, O Lord. Remove all that stands between us and your truth. Tear down the idols of our hearts, O God, that might cause us to be unable or unwilling to hear what the spirit has to say to your church today. And we pray, O Lord, that you would bless and comfort and encourage and strengthen your people even as we look at a dark hour 
in the ministry of your Son, who is our Savior and Lord, and who shines brightly even there. Bless us as we come to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now God's word, John chapter 13, beginning at verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then, after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to Judas, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he, Judas, immediately went out, and it was night. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. There was a lot of confusion in the upper room that night, far more than any of the disciples probably realized. They all had different things on their minds. John told us at the beginning of chapter 13 what was on Jesus' mind at this time. He knows that the hour has come. He is determined to love his disciples to the very end. We can guess what is on Judas Iscariot's mind. He is thinking, no doubt, of the bargain that he has already made to hand Jesus over to the chief priests. We don't know what the rest of the disciples were thinking about, but judging from the conversations recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the same supper period, and judging from Peter's own response to Jesus' foot-washing administration earlier in the evening, we can guess that they are thinking more carnally and personally than uh, we might have otherwise hoped. Surely none of them knew how significant this Last Supper was going to prove to be. They would see that only in retrospect. Our text today in verse 30 contains one of the most fascinating literary techniques, I believe, in John's gospel when he says, Judas goes out and it is night. John's Greek is very basic, but his use of literary references and theological types is quite skillful. And so as Judas goes out, darkness falls. And this is more than just a historical and temporal reference. But I want to hasten to say that does not mean that it is ahistorical or unhistorical. I believe that John is accurately reporting the time of day, but the point of his reference to it is not merely to note what time of day it was. It is to note the theological significance of this moment. It's to remind us that the hour has come, the hour in redemptive history, when the darkness will surround and appear to overcome even the light of the world. But it should remind us immediately of what John told us at the very beginning of his narrative in the prologue, John chapter 1 and verse 1. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And now here is the darkness. It has fallen, but we know already that the darkness will not prevail. It will neither overcome nor truly comprehend the Son of God. And that's the theme that I want you to focus on as we consider these verses together this morning. I want to suggest three headings for us in doing so. We see first that Jesus is trusting in divine sovereignty, and yet he is troubled in spirit. The very text that we're looking at opens with this, with this acknowledgement that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And we may have difficulty reconciling that kind of a statement with what we know about the Son of God. How can we reconcile Jesus being troubled in spirit with him being the divine, the eternally begotten Son of God, the one who knows the end from the beginning, who knows why he is here, who knows what is coming, he knows the Father's plan. He knew who Judas was from the beginning. He chose him as a disciple for this very purpose that Judas might be the betrayer who fulfilled Scripture. But you need to understand that Jesus is not troubled in his divine nature here. uh, 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 Being troubled or disturbed in spirit is a human experience. And so here is the human nature of Christ that is troubled by the circumstances that he finds himself in, even as he knows perfectly as the God-man the purpose of these circumstances, and what the outcome will be. 
Jesus knows what lies ahead, and he knows what lies beyond Judas' immediate betrayal. He knows that his death will be followed by resurrection. He knows that his death will secure the eternal redemption of the elect of God. He knows that the Father is in control of all things. But listen when I say this, that knowledge does not preclude the experience of grief and disturbance. Not even for the God-man. The Christ is disturbed, is troubled in his spirit. And it's not because he's ignorant. It's not because he's overcome by fear. It's not because he lacks faith. Now the knowledge of the Father's plan, the knowledge of God's purposeful sovereignty even in the darkness certainly changes the experience of grief, both for Jesus and for us. He does not sorrow as those who are without hope. He is not overtaken by the sort of fear and doubt that is uncertain of the outcome. But he is troubled in spirit nonetheless, and you need to see clearly in the text that that's the case. You can know the plan and purpose of God. You can know His promises. You can know that they are true. You can know that they will be fulfilled and still be troubled in your spirit as you encounter difficulty and sorrows in this life. It's not unspiritual to be troubled in heart. Now, our sorrow should be tempered by faith. We should not grieve and doubt and fear as those who are without hope in the world around us. But it is not unspiritual to be troubled. And when your heart hears a whisper to the contrary, you should know that that is the voice of the accuser. That is your enemy. That is the adversary. Taking advantage of that moment to try to convince you that if you were a real Christian, you wouldn't feel this way. You see, if you were really a believer, you would never be troubled in spirit. You need to remember that Jesus, your Savior, was. You need to rebuke Him and then ignore Him and start speaking truth to your heart. Pray the Psalms, where we so often see God's saints dealing with this very issue. Affirm God's promises that you know are true. Remind yourself of His sovereign control and of His good purpose to work all things, even bad things, for the good of His people. Remind yourself of the security of being loved by God, but do not embrace the foolish notion that true Christians are never troubled in spirit. Jesus was, and we certainly will be. Now, as you continue reflecting on this text, you may see that like the disciples, it is sometimes the case that God's people know what is true and yet find themselves unable to respond to it. There is a, a fascinating exchange in this passage that if we had a, more time or different circumstances, we might unpack even further than we will today. But Jesus conclusively identifies Judas in the room. He identifies Judas as the betrayer and as we're reading this text, we may wonder, why didn't the disciples do anything about that? Why doesn't Peter say, there he is, get him, right? Why doesn't somebody jump on him? Why doesn't somebody follow up and ask Jesus, tell us, tell us what's going on, what do you actually mean? But John is explicit that they did not understand what was going on. As clear as Jesus is, they did not understand why Judas was going out. They did not know what was really going on as the subtext of this conversation. And we need to dig a little bit deeper here for just a moment to, to kind of help flesh this out somewhat. Jesus and his disciples in the upper room that night would no doubt have been reclining at the table. You see references to this even in the way that the beloved disciple, presumably John, is leaning back to speak to Jesus. He's lying at Jesus' side. They would be lying on their left side. Their legs and feet would be stretched out behind them at a, at a very low table. Now, the beloved disciple, whom we are assuming is the Apostle John, is on Jesus' right side. And that's how he can lean back in order to speak to Jesus. We don't know exactly where Peter is sitting, but he is sitting adjacent to the beloved disciple so that they are able to make eye contact. So quite probably across the table or in another corner of the room. And that's how Peter is able to signal to the beloved disciple, ask him what he's talking about. Who, who is this betrayer that he is speaking of? We don't know who is sitting on Jesus' left side, which some commentators suggest would have been a position of prominence. But implications in the text have led a lot of commentators to imagine that Judas may have been the one. He's at least close enough that Jesus can easily pass a morsel of bread to him. 
There would have been a lot of conversation going on at the table that night. There are at least 13 men in the room, and probably more than that, based on other texts of Scripture that allude to the presence of some who were not apostles and yet who spent all this time with Jesus and those who were apostles at the time. We don't know how many other people there might have been, but even if there are only the 13 of Jesus and his apostles, you can imagine there's a lot of conversation at the table and not everyone is participating in every part of that conversation. Many commentators, not only modern, but even more established and ancient authors, even Matthew Henry in his commentary alludes to the fact that he believes that Jesus whispered to John that the morsel would identify the traitor. That piece of information may not have been publicly announced to everyone at the, tra- at the table so that all knew, here is the betrayer. But even if they knew that Judas was the one who would betray Jesus, they surely did not understand what that would actually mean. Because Mark tells us that when Jesus says, one of you will surely betray me, they all begin asking themselves, is it I? Am I the one? they do not imagine that one of them is going to sell Jesus out to the chief priests. They are imagining an inadvertent betrayal, an unintentional disappointment. One of us is going to let Jesus down. That's what they hear Jesus saying, perhaps because they cannot imagine that anyone would do what Judas actually does. At least John, at least John, understands that Jesus is identifying Judas as the one when he hands him that morsel of food. And why doesn't John react? Maybe he is too stunned to answer. Maybe he, like the rest, really doesn't understand the significance of what that means. But in any event, whether it was only John who realized the identification, or whether it was John and Peter, or whether it was all the disciples, none of them really knew what to do with that information. And we shouldn't be too hard on the disciples in this case. Jesus did not reveal this information in the upper room that night so that one of them would do something about it, so that Peter would recognize the danger and pounce on Judas at that point and try to to stop him. In fact, later in the evening, when they're in the garden and Peter does draw a sword and try to prevent Jesus' arrest, Jesus is going to rebuke him. And Jesus is going to prevent Peter from preventing that event. So Jesus is not identifying the betrayer. He's not saying these things so that the disciples will do something about it. But he is planting seeds that they will later reflect upon and understand more fully. The Lord did not identify Judas for the sake of saving himself, but rather as a confirmation of the traitor in his sin and reprobation. And this easily could have been our theme this morning because this text has a lot to say about the idea of being handed over for judgment. When Jesus passes that morsel of food to Judas, the devil fully entered into him. And Judas surely is a servant of the the devil prior to that time, but now we might say he is possessed. He is fully under the adversary's control. The Lord has handed him over to his own will, and now Judas will be destroyed by his own greed. And if we cherish sin and wickedness, then we will ourselves eventually be given over to it. We must pray and struggle against it all of our lives. John Owen rightly said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Those are the only two possibilities in the Christian life. Three times in Romans chapter 1, the Bible describes the Lord giving up the unregenerate world to greater and greater depravity. And there is a fascinating contrast that we will see probably next year at the end of John's gospel between the way that Jesus hands over Judas to his sin and refuses to hand Peter over to his. You see, Peter is not saved because he is more humble, more honest, more noble-minded. He's saved because Jesus is so good. But eventually the Lord will give unregenerate man the freedom that he desires, and that man will then use that freedom to destroy himself. But that's not the application I want to focus on today. As important as that theme is, instead I want to urge you to focus on the implications of the disciples' own experience for our lives. They are hearing and learning of things that they cannot fully comprehend. 
And even though they may have different levels of awareness of what Jesus is saying and exactly what it means, none of them are able in any meaningful way to truly respond to it. And the Lord didn't intend for them to do so. That information, as we said a moment ago, would only be understood in retrospect. He's planting seeds in their heart that would later be brought to fruition through the outpouring of the Spirit and later greater inspiration. The Lord does not intend us to know conclusively and understand all that He says and does at the present time. How how could that be the plan, right? That is not God's plan in the present age. We remain infants in our understanding in many ways. We are to study and meditate and grow in our understanding, but at the end of our lives, our understanding and knowledge will still be very incomplete. Now that incompleteness does not invalidate what we can and do know. We walk by faith and we live in the light of what we know from God's own self-revelation. The fact that we do not know everything does not mean that we cannot know anything. But it does mean we should remain humble because we know for certain that we do not know everything that the Lord knows and everything that He is doing. Many times in our lives we have to simply affirm that God is real and that His promises are true and that He is in control of all things even though we do not understand what He is doing at a particular time. That's where the disciples are in this room that night. They don't know what Jesus is talking about and the the events following the Last Supper are going to so rattle them that they are going to forsake him. They are going to scatter. Peter is going to deny that he even knows Jesus. Fishermen are going to return to their family business. They they, they don't know how to process what the Lord is doing. And you may find yourself in a moment like that. You say, I cannot understand what is going on, and yet I know that God is still on his throne. I know that what his word says is true. I know that his promises will be fulfilled. I don't see how that can be from where I'm sitting, but I know it is real nonetheless. This is not a blind or irrational faith. It is based on God's own revelation of himself. We have seen his glory and his goodness in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen his faithfulness through redemptive history in the lives of his people, and we have experienced his providence in our own lives. And we can trust Him. We must, we must trust Him. He has proven Himself worthy of that trust. And it's not because we blindly hope that maybe He will prove to be true, but it's because He has proven Himself again and again. And we should never doubt His goodness and faithfulness in our trials and distress. You see, your relationship with the Lord is not starting over every time you hit a rough patch. You say, well, God has been good before, but I don't know. Maybe he's changed. He hasn't. Why have you? If he was faithful before, if his word is true before, it is still true today. It is still true for you in your present distress. God is always doing more than we know. His word discloses more than we can ever understand. We may be stunned in silence and confusion by what he does at a particular point in our lives, but we can rest in the certain knowledge that his purpose is good and that he governs all things to their appointed end. We do not rest in our understanding of his work. This is the difference. If you are trusting the Lord only when you think you know what he's doing, you are walking by sight, not by faith. You are trusting in your own insightfulness. But to walk by faith means we trust God when we don't understand what he's doing, but we know that he is good, and we know that he is worthy of our trust. We rest in Him. He is our refuge. And when darkness falls, we know that it will not overcome His plan because it did not overcome the sun. And then finally, I want you to reflect on the fact that we may be surrounded by darkness, and yet even there, like Christ and like these disciples, we are watching for the dawn. Jesus handed the morsel to Judas and sent him on his way. The devil took complete control and the plan of redemption that had been decreed from the foundation of the world reached critical mass. This is the point of no return. Night has fallen. The hour of the enemy's triumph has arrived. The Son of God will pass into darkness, but that will not be the end of the light. The true light will dawn. Morning is coming. And although the darkness may be greatest just before the dawn, the appearance of that morning is certain. You will not appreciate the sunrise unless there is darkness that precedes it. We would never experience the morning of joy without the night of tears. 
The darkness has fallen, but there is no reason for despair. God's glory is best seen in contrast to sin's power. And what you and I need to know is that we will never have to endure that kind of night that Jesus did because Christ overcame it for us. The night that falls in this chapter is not the night that falls on your soul. And the reason is that the Son of God overcomes that night. Day dawns. Resurrection morning arrives. That changes your experience forever. But that does not mean that you will never be surrounded by another kind of darkness. Some of the greatest saints have known the dark night of the soul and have experienced profound spiritual depression and grief. We see it in the Bible and the experience of men like Job, Elijah, and Jeremiah. We know of it throughout church history and the experience of men like Martin Luther and William Cooper and Charles Spurgeon. Faith does not preclude the experience of great grief, but it does temper that grief with an invincible hope. R.C. Sproul wrote about this experience a few years before he died. He said this, quote, The presence of faith gives no guarantee of the absence of spiritual depression. However, the dark night of the soul always gives way to the brightness of the noonday light of the presence of God. And you must believe that. You must know that. The writer of Lamentations, presumably Jeremiah, has much to say about this in chapter 3, and I would commend reflection upon that chapter to you. But my favorite reference to it, at least in the Old Testament prophetic literature, is found at the end of the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, beginning at verse 17. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation." The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Can you pray that when you hear from the Lord that your home is going to be destroyed, that your nation is going to be overthrown, that your family and friends are going to be slaughtered in the streets? Can can you hear that when you know that your nation that has been the nation of God, the people of God, the light among all the world, that that nation is going to pass into captivity and that you will not live to see that exile end? Can you pray that? Habakkuk does. And by God's grace, with his spirit, we can pray with him as well. Believing in the sovereignty of God does not spare us from experiencing grief and pain and confusion in the outworking of his eternal decree. Thank God that His plan and promises do not depend on our insightfulness and our ability to process and properly respond to what He is doing because if it depended on that, then it would not come to pass. His ways are greater than our feeble minds will ever be able to grasp, but we can rest in the certainty that He remains on the throne and in control. We can rejoice in the fact that neither the disciples' confusion nor Judas' betrayal nor the enemy's violence could change or overthrow the good that God purposed to perform. And Christian, that is the message today, is that you would trust in Him when night falls. That you would trust in Him when you find yourself overtaken by darkness. You may be overtaken, you will not be overcome, because Christ has already overcome. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not have any power over it. Look to the cross. Look to the victory that Jesus won over that darkness. And be sure that he has banished the eternal darkness that threatens to overwhelm your soul. He is the true light, and it shines brightly. And may he give his servants eyes to see it. Let's bow together. Our God and Father, we thank you that though darkness comes, that your Son has overcome it. We thank you that though there is sin and a curse that must be dealt with in this present age, that though this world lies under the sway of the wicked one, that though we ourselves will suffer and be tempted and tried in many different ways, that nevertheless we find victory in Christ and peace because he has indeed overcome. Oh Lord, we pray that You would help us to be sustained by your Spirit, that we would not fall into doubt, that we would never despair, that we would rest in you, that we would confess that your promises are true, that you would cling to your providence, O Lord, 
even when we do not understand your way. Lead us safely through the present age. Lead us through the night to the dawning of the eternal day. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, we have a very special blessing today in that we will celebrate both the sacraments of the New Covenant. Uh, I'm going to ask Andrew and Sophia and Jaden and Trevin Steedman to come to the front at this time. And both of these young men are going to be baptized today. And maybe we could have the ruling elders come up here as well and join us. Stand over here. We'll fit everybody in up here. You have an extra order of worship that uh, was available on the music stand, a little bit of a fuller order than normally our baptismal services would be, and this is because these two young men are receiving God's sign and seal of baptism today on two different bases, both depending upon the promise of God and the direction of His Word, but Jaden coming as a professing believer. And the elders, as we examined him, were encouraged by his testimony of God's grace, his love for the Lord Jesus, his ability to articulate uh, the gospel and to come with maturity and discernment to the Lord's table. And so we're going to baptize him today as a professing believer and welcome him into full communion as a member of this church. Trevin also, speaking of his love for Christ, for which we give God great thanks, as a covenant child in submission to his parents is receiving baptism today in the name of the triune God uh, as a child who is properly comprehended within the visible church and within God's external administration of the covenant of grace and will be a non-communicant member of this church today. So we'll welcome both of these young men on those, uh, in those ways. And, uh, and have vows that will be taken both by Jaden and by his parents because of that. Let me begin by reading from the Word of God printed there on your handout in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Lord Jesus instituted baptism as a covenant sign and seal for his church. He uses it not only for the solemn admission of the person who was baptized into the visible church, but also to depict and to confirm his engrafting of that person into himself and his including that person in the covenant of grace. The Lord uses baptism to portray that we and our children are conceived and born in sin and need to be cleansed. He uses it to witness and seal to us the remission of sins and the bestowal of all the gifts of salvation through union with Christ. Baptism with water signifies and seals cleansing from sin by the blood and spirit of Christ together with our death unto sin and our resurrection unto newness of life by virtue of the death and resurrection of Christ. The time of the outward application of the sign does not necessarily coincide with the inward work of the Holy Spirit which the sign represents and seals to us. Because these gifts of salvation are the gracious provision of the triune God who is pleased to claim us as His very own, we are baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In our baptism, the Lord puts His name on us, claims us as His own, and summons us to assume the obligations of the covenant. He calls us to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, to renounce the devil, the world, and the flesh, and to walk humbly with our God in devotion to His commandments. Now a word to the members of the congregation today, as solemn vows are to be made before you, and baptism is now to be administered, you who are baptized will do well to take this occasion to reflect on your own baptism. Christ has put His name and claim on you. He calls you to be repentant for your sins against your covenant God, to confess your faith before men, and to live in newness of life to God, who sealed His covenant with you by the blood of His own Son. And since we do have one covenant child being baptized on that basis today, it's appropriate for us to say a few words about that. 
even before our youngest children are able to make a personal profession of faith, they are to be baptized. For God commands that all who are under his covenant of grace be given the sign of the covenant. God made the promise of the covenant to believers and to their offspring. In the Old Testament, he declared to Abraham, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. For this reason, in the Old Testament, God commanded that covenant children be given the sign of circumcision. The covenant is the same, in essence, in both the Old and the New Testaments. Indeed, the grace of God for the consolation of believers is even more fully manifested in the New Testament. Thus, rather than rescinding the covenant promise to believers and to their offspring, in the New Testament, God reaffirms it. He declares that the promise is to you and to your children. He promises, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. He affirms that if even one parent is a believer, the children are holy. Moreover, our Savior admitted little children into his presence, embracing and blessing them and saying, of such is the kingdom of God. And so in the New Testament, no less than in the Old, the children of believers have an interest in the covenant and a right to the covenant sign and to the outward privileges of the covenant people, the church. In the New Testament, baptism has replaced circumcision as the covenant sign. Therefore, by the covenant sign of baptism, the children of believers are to be distinguished from the world and solemnly admitted into the visible church. And so that is what we are here today to do and to celebrate as we see God continuing to work in this way even to, through many generations, right? Now, the covenant commitment of Andrew and Sophia as the parents of both Jaden and Trevin. Do you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore are subject to condemnation, they are holy in Christ by virtue of the covenant of grace and as children of the covenant are to be baptized? <laughs> Praise God. Do you promise to teach diligently to your sons the principles of our holy Christian faith revealed in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and summarized in the confession of faith and catechisms of this church? Praise God. Do you promise to pray regularly with and for your sons and to set an example of piety and godliness before them? Praise God. And do you promise to endeavor by all the means that God has appointed to bring your sons up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, encouraging them to appropriate for themselves the blessings and fulfill the obligations of the covenant? Praise God. They do, and they have, and that's how we are here. Do we see God's covenant faithfulness even in families as they continue to wrestle through these issues and seek to, to bring their children uh, in these ways to know Christ? Now, for Jaden, as you confess your faith before us today, I would address you as one who is beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank our God for the grace that he has given you in that our Savior has sought and found you, and through faith you have become a partaker of the covenant of grace. We rejoice that in his grace he has brought you to this congregation and given you the desire to profess your faith before us and to unite with us. And we ask that you testify before us to the faith that you profess by giving assent to the following questions. Do you believe the Bible, consisting of the Old and New Testaments, to be the Word of God and its doctrine of salvation, to be the perfect and only true doctrine of salvation? Praise God. Do you believe in one living and true God, in whom eternally there are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who are the same in being and equal in power and glory, and that Jesus Christ is God the Son come in the flesh? Praise God. Do you confess that because of your sinfulness you abhor and humble yourself before God, that you repent of your sin, and that you trust for salvation not in yourself, but in Jesus Christ alone? Praise God. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your sovereign Lord? And do you promise that, in reliance on the grace of God, you will serve Him with all that is in you, forsake the world, resist the devil, put to death your sinful deeds and desires, and lead a godly life? Praise God. And finally, do you promise to participate faithfully in this church's worship and service, to submit in the Lord to its government, and to heed its discipline, even in case you should be found delinquent in doctrine or life? Praise God. I'm so thankful that you do. Let's bow together in prayer. Our God and Father, this is a joy to us. Every time we are able to welcome your people, 
Every time we are able to see the evidences of your Spirit's work in the hearts and lives of those whom you have brought to faith. And as we see households, O Lord, wrestling with the text of Scripture, endeavoring to be obedient to you, to, to see your promises placed upon the heads of their children, we thank you, O God, for this grace also and for the joy of sharing together in this moment. O Lord, we thank you for the Steedman family. We thank you for the ways that you worked in their lives over many years, for the ways in which your grace is seen in their testimony and their experience of your kind providence. And we thank you for these two young men. We thank you for Jaden and for Trevin. We thank you, O Lord, that you have brought them up in submission to their parents, that you have brought them to this point to a love for you, O Lord, and a desire to be obedient to you and pleasing to you. We thank you for Jaden's profession of faith before us and for the testimony of grace that we, his elders, have heard. We thank you, O Lord, for giving us tangible signs of your covenant promises and of the blessings that come to us through the work of Christ and are applied to our hearts by your Spirit received through faith. O Lord, we ask you to bless these boys, both young men, and that you would bless them as they receive this sign of baptism, that they would not trust merely in an outward application, O Lord, of ritual, but rather that your spirit would be pleased to truly seal and apply the promises signified here to their hearts and to their souls for their everlasting salvation and for your everlasting praise and glory among all your saints. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Jaden, I think I want to baptize you first, if that's all right. All right? I'm going to turn you just a little bit here. Jaden, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Trevin? Trevin, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. We warned them that I'm a wet baptizer. <laughs> As Jaden and Trevin are baptized into Christ and become members of His visible church, the whole congregation is obligated to love them and receive them as members of the body of Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body and are therefore members of one another. Christ claims these young men as his own and calls you to receive them in love and commitment. Therefore, you ought to commit yourself before God to assist Jaden and Trevin and their parents in their Christian nurture by your godly example, prayer, and your encouragement in our most precious faith. To Andrew and Sophia... Beloved in Christ Jesus, we give thanks to God for the children that He has given you and for your expressed desire for them to know the Lord and to follow Him all their days. Along with the great blessing of the gift of children have come responsibilities that you have just acknowledged and to which you have solemnly committed yourselves. And I charge you to continue steadfastly in the commitments that you have made today before God and these witnesses, humbly relying upon the grace of God in the diligent use of the means of grace, especially the Word of God, the sacraments, and prayer. And Jaden, as you are welcomed into full communion and to the Lord's table in just a few minutes, beloved, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I welcome you to all the privileges of full communion with God's people, and in particular to participation in the sacrament of the Holy Supper. I charge you to continue steadfastly in the confession that you have made, humbly relying upon the grace of God in the diligent use of the means of grace, especially the Word of God, the sacraments, and prayer. Rest assured that if you confess Christ before men, He will confess you before His Father who is in heaven. May the God of all grace, who called you unto His eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, and strengthen you. To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you that your promises are true and that they apply to your people even for a thousand generations. We thank you, O Lord, that though sin and the curse extend for many centuries, 
that your grace will extend forever, world without end. Bless these young men. Bless this family. Bless us as a church. Oh Lord, confirm your promises. Continue your good work. And the good work that you begin, bring to full completion. We ask, O oh Lord, in Jesus' holy name. this day many reasons to be reminded of God's effectual work of grace that he offers to us that he calls us to that he draws us to himself and that the gospel is signified in these covenant signs that he's given us both baptism and also in the Lord's Supper let's take our hymnals together and turn now to number 352 and if you're able, as we sing in preparation for coming to the Lord's table, let's stand together. Number 352, Man of Sorrows. What a name. He is. Amen. If you'll turn in the back of the hymnal to page 852, you'll find printed there the words of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, not to be confused at all with Scripture, but rather as an ancient and faithful summary of that which Scripture teaches infallibly and ultimately. We use it every Lord's Day as a means, an instrument of examining ourselves as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. And it is my privilege as a minister of the gospel to invite all who are trusting in Jesus Christ this day for your salvation, who are resting in His righteousness alone and not in yourself and your own, who are members in good standing of a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, who are seeking to walk humbly and faithfully before the Lord in repentance, then this supper is for you, and you are welcome to share in it today. You do not have to be a member of our congregation or our denomination to be welcome here. But we would admonish you as well, if you are visiting with us, 
and our youngest children who are even baptized members of this congregation but are not yet able to come to the table with discernment, that we dare not do so in a casual or cavalier way, that if you are here today and you are not trusting in Jesus Christ, that you are resting not in the righteousness of another but rather in your own, if you are rejecting the place of the church and the life of the child of God, wanting no part or no fellowship with it, if you are walking not in repentance and humility, but rather in hypocrisy, then we would admonish you just as we do admonish our young children not to take of the bread or of the cup. Not because we want to single you out or make you feel unwelcome in any way, but we want to impress upon you how serious the sacrament of the Lord's table is. That this is not a mere memorial, that it's not just a church ritual that we perform, but it is a true experience of communion with the true and the living God by means of the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed, recited for centuries by the saints as a confession of what we do believe. Church, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.